This is Richard Burbage, born 1568, died 1619, leading actor in Shakespeare's company, and he probably been the first that played Hamlet. Wow, that's just the front piece. Row edition, 1709. This is John Philip Campbell, 1755, no, 1757. I don't have the exact date when he played the role. That's um, drawing by Delacroix, the very famous scene when uh, Hamlet is awaiting the actors and uh, he says to Ophelia, that's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. Philbert Rouvier, 1847. This was the date, the time that he played the role in the Theatre Historique in France, Paris. <laughs> And that's a design for Charles Fichter's Hamlet, 1864. And that's a letter for me. The making of the film you are about to see was accompanied by a feverish correspondence between me and my friend Hovhannis Pelikian. One particular letter comes to my mind while I am going up Primrose Hill to meet him. In this letter he declares, O dead my honey heart, in my own spiritual reckoning I could never agree that any of my work has been a failure. All my work, in my terms, have been successful. Praying to the gods of diplomacy that will guide my pen, I answered. You agree that the terms failure or success be used only when evaluating your Hamlet commercially. But I would go further and say that any other kind of success or failure in the theatre is just in the eye of the beholder. This is why in the case of your production, I didn't have in mind any artistic evaluation and of course I do not care a bit about the box office turnover. What I meant us to do is to examine your production as a process affected by talent, resources, human relationships, social environment and as such to find out why it failed to yield a product that will live long enough to prove its potential. Seven years ago you set out to produce your unique interpretation of Hamlet. The show disintegrated two weeks after its first night. Why? Whether you meet my friend Hovhannis Pelikian as a family man, as a scholar, as a womanizer, as a teacher, as an Armenian obsessed with his heritage, you still haven't met the real Hovhannis Israel Pelikian. Yes, that's Havanis <laughs> done. Havanis, yes, yes. yes. For he is only one thing, the epitome of the spirit of drama on earth. <laughs> I should know. I know him now for 30 years. <laughs> this is Mr. Hugh Crattle former principal of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. You uh, mentioned the other students, the English students. Uh, you three, 
Yeah. The you three exotic people all went on to, to interesting careers and have survived in the profession and more than survived. Yeah. But um, the other two, they were very, they were younger, more immature. Yes, yes. I don't know whether in, a, in age, I imagine you and Pelikin were a bit older. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, oh my <laughs> God, the entrance to the yes. <laughs> the entrance to the... And, we used to go up and another letter followed. My dear Hovhannis, You've been probably right when you wrote that maybe by trying to find out what happened to your fat Hamlet, I am searching for my own salvation. We are two of a kind. And alas, the theatre has been an obsession for both of us. It's an obsession that can't be cured but deserves coming to terms with. And that can be done sometimes by going through a cleansing act, a self-purifying ritual. Maybe, my friend, this is what this film is about. The first one was the lesson, of course, yeah. yeah. So there is the... goes underneath and to another corner. I exactly my very first impression, but uh, my general impression of him at Rada, he was always a bit of a mystery, I suppose. I think... Um, well, I never was absolutely able to make up my mind as to whether he was a genius. There seemed to be a possibility of his being a rather sort of erratic, offbeat genius, or whether he was just, um, I was going to say, a clever fraud. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. Yes. I'm not suggesting he was deliberately fraudulent, but I mean, um, he was a... He was a, a skillful and in some ways I think probably quite a cunning person and very clever and astute and I suppose he was capable really of projecting an image of himself yeah. which one wasn't absolutely certain one could believe, you know. For me, theatre is not an art form. Uh, it is not even a life form. It is more a kind of exploration of what it means to be human. To this day, I'm not sure whether... Former drama critic of um, the Times, Mr. Erwin Wordle, our tutor. Whether what he was talking was brilliant or, or, or inspired speculation. So I remember one... What's the difference? One special... I, well, maybe I didn't get, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't get that, uh, that contrast quite as accurately as I should have. I'll give you one example, which yeah. was one class we had together. I think we were doing The Way of the World, and, and in the middle of which yeah. uh, Hovhannis informed us that this was, a, in fact, a Chinese work, <laughs> uh, because um, the court of Charles II in exile had spent it partly in Amsterdam and partly in Paris, which was then the, the, the centre that was then on the, on the chinoiserie route, and therefore... Would you go home and check it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and therefore, this is what this didn't, didn't have nothing whatever to do with the manners of the court of Louis the Louis the Fourteenth, yes. or indeed uh, the English um, uh, English um, aristocracy when they got back home. But had and you were worried maybe he's right. Uh, I had a feeling maybe there's something because <laughs> the thing is, Hoffenis had the advantage of drawing on a much greater spectrum of knowledge about the world than I had because I was very much and remain very much bounded inside English culture. I try uh, in my modest way to try and expand that. I had no real defence against Hoffenis' argument because I knew nothing about the operation of the Chinoiserie route, the China <laughs> or the Silk or the Silk it's Road. The Silk Road. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the um, in the 17th century, and therefore I was just uh, uh, reduced to st listening to this with my eyes popping out, and, um, and no doubt falling falling unhelpfully silent for the rest of our session together. So that's one of my that's one of my a strong memory of Hoffelis that I do have, especially as he used to put all these points with extreme courtesy and deference. All the whereas time. In, whereas but in, insisting on the time in, that, that, that he was in fact the intellectually dominant partner. So. <laughs> Yes, that's Havana's done. Havana's, yes, yes. All right. But I have to be polite and smile and love. And when I'm polite and smile and love, they think I'm okay. To be? My friend. Well, or not to be? So, uh, uh, that is the question. So you see, when I laugh and smile, they think, you yeah, know, well, in fact, I have backache and everything. But dead, my sweetheart, I cannot describe to you what I'm going through. I feel Satan has grabbed hold of my Hamlet again. You won't believe this, but I have to move house. You're best to leave those in, and when they come next week, bring The council has been talking about modernizing our kitchen and bathroom for two years now. They were supposed to have done it before Christmas, 
than during April. Now, suddenly, they're doing it now. I must really go and jump off the mountain cliffs in Wales. Well, it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. That's 41 boxes. There's more. So the day you wanted to shoot, we will have to have packed up a whole house, etc., etc. I bet you ain't ready every single one of them, have you? Of course I have ready. You've read them all? I mean, I know all of them. All right, tell me what that one's about. Yeah. Yeah, you just read there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Did you see this book or not? I love my books. I can see that. On the 20th, they want to come and take some of my stuff to storage. I just can't believe it. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's consummate, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patience merit of unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. I don't know what is in there, spiders, rats, mice, I don't know, I mean, this is three years. I have 2,000 books in my house, but another 10,000 locked in a shed in the garden. What am I supposed to do with them? There's no lock on it. I haven't opened for three years because I don't know what to do with it. Uh, if I open, what can I do with it? Yeah. How much damage has the system being in there for three years? Do I know? Do I know? I, and so this is think. thousands of pounds. I mean, it is a lifetime's, you know, wealth there, you know. And, I mean, do you see my state of affairs now? Of course they and, uh, say, if you have a roof over your head, be happy. Other people have no roof. Nicole, it's not enough, it's not enough. Yes, but yeah. But it's also not my, it is my life, my books are my life, I have nothing else. You've still got them. Yeah, and we counted 65 of the books. We are signing the, we are signing the charter. He's the charter of the United Magna Carta. Oh, yeah. A running maid. Yeah. What case is 65 boxes? Thus. Conscience, Conscience does make, does make cowards, cowards of us all. all. And, and thus, thus the native, the native hue of resolution, resolution is sickly by, by a pale, pale cast of thought. And, and enterprises of great pitch and, and moment with disregard their, their current turn, turn awry and, and lose, lose the name of action. action. Uh, Steve. Uh, I, I mean, first of all, I, you are absolutely ravishingly beautiful, beautiful. But can I, that line there, you see, which is extremely important because it establishes the physical tragedy. Who would fardels bear? Who would fardels bear to grant? Now, I need that line very, 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 almost like a, a Russian poet speaking. Every word, give it its weight, very slow. Who would fathers bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life it needs to be your that is it you're Why? fed up very tired totally worn out and you know this is in a sense uh, the whole point of uh, right the, so, so the, he's referring to himself directly right, rather, rather right. than to everyone it's else own, yeah. exactly exactly yeah you're fed up with Initially, played Hamlet in 1886, and that's a kind of Hamlet we already know. Melancholic chap. Vasily Karatyagin, around uh, eight, <laughs> again Meg, 1830 in St. Petersburg, seems to be a pretty robust Hamlet. Edwin Booth, very well known Hamlet, an intellectual one. In 1870, Joseph Keynes. A very handsome fellow was very much adored in his period. Um, the Borg Theatre, he played Hamlet from 1814 to 1832. I mean, 
Henry VIII was the icon of the pre-Elizabethan age and post-Elizabethan age. And in a sense, uh, all the artists were uh, entirely uh, dominated by this figure. And it so happened that he was enormously corpulent and burnt, and he was notorious for eating too much, etc. Do we agree that people are what they eat? If so, what people haven't understood, and it is worth noting, is that food for a very long time was irregular. It was not standardized at all like in modern times when you can find McDonald's everywhere. So what happened is that uh, uh, medieval nourishment, of course also Renaissance, etc., even in Victorian times, produced very grotesque human figures. The shape and the figure, the human figure and the shape was outrageously uh, unpredictable. So what you get is the fat, the thin, the short, the small, the enormously sort of uh, uh, suave, whatever, you know. In other words, it is almost like a, a, a grotesque uh, bestiary of people, unlike modern times where wherever you go, uh, youth is almost, you know, the same height, the same <laughs> sort of uh, uh, size. And this is a very important point for theatre directors especially to understand. They should cast Elizabethan drama, what especially Shakespeare, uh, according to Polonius be fat? Well, not really. Polonius because the would, skimming sort yes, of, uh, yes. or whatever, would he be thin? I think he would be thin. Polonius, in fact, is I mean, a agreeing very with Shakespeare that thin yeah, people yeah, are very yeah, skimming yeah, and yeah, devious, yeah, etc. Yeah, exactly, and, uh, exactly. And, uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, ironically, there is scientific be, basis for in this. In your because production, what Claudius would? Oh, he would be fat. He in fact, be fat. In fact, of course, was he fat? Absolutely. Claudius is a second Henry VIII. Was in other words, there are two Henry VIII's that shows how Shakespeare was absolutely obsessed by this uh, icon. So Claudius absolutely is the Henry VIII character. The young Hamlet is the young Henry VIII. And there is, of course, the ghost. The ghost also should be fat, because Hamlet's father How was enormously corrupt. In the, in the, uh I in had the production. in the production my ghost was Claudius himself. Was Claudius Absolutely. himself? Absolutely. The glass of fashion and the mold of form, that's yes. exactly the sentence which establishes Hamlet as fashionable. Yes. But no one would understand what she then concludes at the end. That unmatched form and feature of blown youth. Uh, blown, you mean blasted with ecstasy. You yeah, see? So blown, so you take it just literally as absolutely. Fat. In other words, <laughs> Ophelia is saying that Hamlet is a blown up fat so and blasted with ecstasy. Blasted, blasted is another ecstasy. is another. In other words, there is a double metaphor of not only fat but enormous fat. Being in the profession for so long and having probably seen many Hamlets and knowing so much about the play, what do you think about the idea? The idea of a fat Hamlet. Yeah. Well, I've I longed to see one. Fancy thy name is woman. Uh, partly because, autobiographically speaking, I I played Hamlet when I was at school and I was fat. Uh, <laughs> so I have a certain personal personal interest in this. Oh, that this too too solid flesh would melt. Thor. And resolve itself into a dew. And uh, it seemed to me, that, that with speaking through the mentality of, of, of well, I'm still, I'm still not thin, but I was, I was, I was really was a chubby youth. It has a lot to do that with this kind of self hatred that comes upon you when you do feel you're the wrong, you're the wrong shape. Going right back to that first soliloquy, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. In other words, why can't I drop all this tallow, you know, and, and, and reveal the lie, a sexually attractive person that's inside it, if only, if only, I, could, if only I could drop all these superfluous avidue poi. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. Oh, God. God! How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fiant, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this. But two months dead. Hey, not so much, not two. 
So excellent a king it was to this Hyperion, to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not be deemed the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. <laughs> Must I remember why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on and yet within a month let me not think of Frailty, thy name is woman! You know, of course Hamlet is the hero, of course he's very positive, but it is not the kind of positive P Hamlet which people uh, have understood it to be. Hamlet can be very nasty, very evil. He has to survive in an extremely corrupt environment, and therefore he can be evil. In other words, to expect of Hamlet, it's not uh, good against evil, bad against good. It's not that kind of thing. It's very complex much more ambiguous. My point is that if you define then politics outside the uh, global domination problems in terms of human gender problems, man-woman relationship, then the fat person will have more difficulty in finding the right mates. And therefore, in a sense, the politics comes into this, not as a party political problem, yes. but as a problem of human relationship. I mean, fat people have more problems in terms of finding the right mate than, say, like normally say, average, exactly, Sopa. exactly. Although there too, the problem is different, said, then it has to do with fashion. Said, yes, but exactly. you said in your play that Ophelia is pregnant by Hamlet, yes. so he had no problem of finding his mate. No, of course, especially he has no problem because he is a prince. He can have anyone he wants to. Of exalting. course not, of course, of course. But it comes, it boils down to the human relationship and to the individual taste and choice and the problems with it. And he did a pregnant Ophelia and yes. an already pregnant Gertrude. I mean, meaning that Gertrude already, yes. was, you know, pregnant by ah, yes, Claudius. I yes. uh, uh, Yes. Even before, well, mean, there we are. There we have it? the Pelican exactly. <laughs> touch. Yeah. Yes, for but, but, but uh, again, if it's an interesting interpretation, if he could stand behind it, I mean, uh, why not? Uh, have, I mean, you know, let well, him have a chance. He would, of course, be ready with a very well argued justification of it. Well, I mean, a, he'd have that he all has, lined he has up. A book written yes, about it. yes, yes, he he yeah. he, he would have that. Um, but one feels that perhaps the, uh, I, the idea appealed to him before the rationale, as it yes, were. And then, and then I mean he would seek to be able to justify. Yeah. Um, he was yeah, clever, he justify a clever man. And that was part of the interpretation. I wanted a pregnant Ophelia. You wanted a pregnant Ophelia? Or after you saw that the actress was pregnant, you decided that Ophelia was uh, pregnant? No, no, no. If she, in other words, if she wasn't pregnant, I would have made her artificially pregnant. Uh -huh. But she was also naturally pregnant. And, uh -huh. uh, um, so Probably yeah. the audience were expected that she'd take a bath, yeah, yeah. she'd take off the yeah, padding, <laughs> and she did not. And she did not, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. So actually you, you, you felt comfortable with it? I did, I yes, mean, and I thought it was very interesting. Yes. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting that it, it brought it right up to date. Right. I mean, I've forgotten the line now, there's something in the state of Denmark. Yeah, something rotten. Oh, right, yeah. exactly. And, uh, and this is what this... Production, this interpretation was a.